after. So this is recording to the call. This is week five already. Oh my God, week five. You know, this is just, and if, if you're doing the readings every week, there's enough of them for you to basically qualify as having completed R511 by the time you're done with week five readings. So you've gotten through a lot of core information in the first five weeks. Doesn't mean the next 10 are any less important, just means that I realize that there are a lot of important readings and Dr. Regulus article on elaboration theory last week. And lo and behold, I sent you that little two page review of him, um, the true scholar. <laughs> I, I wrote my note, I said, well, you're a false scholar. <laughs> but anyways, that's a little bit, the, the writer was a, a little bit too infatuated with his work, um, but she did a nice job overall writing about Dr. Regulus. But you can see how important he is and his green books and yellow books on instructional design really set the tone for the field for the next couple of decades. And he was able to change with the times and it go from really behaviorist approaches in the green book that I had read to being more open to alternatives, let's just say, and many alternatives, even religious ones uh, in terms of instructional design. So constructivistic, social constructivistic, and so forth. Um, and I also want to make um, you aware that this talk is on diversity, equity, and inclusion, maybe, okay? I put a maybe on it because I had two emails from my colleagues last spring when I gave this talk the first time. I was heading on a plane. I was escaping town, going down to Florida um, to see my brother, and I was going to present to North Texas faculty, University of North Texas. And they said, you're not, the description you're giving is not diversity, equity, and inclusion the way we see it. What you're talking about is old multicultural education. And so um, I, I will just say that the people I presented to at North Texas were very happy with the talk. Colleagues of mine at Indiana were not happy with me framing it as diversity, equity, and inclusion, okay? So the, the, the totally, some people have different perspectives on what is included in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the faculty here seem really interested in the equity side um, I'm my slides relate more so to the diversity side and inclusion side than it is to the equity side. Uh, I find per, as a per, from a personal standpoint, the equity side is a harder to um, address and change society as an individual. We all can, we all can make our our push, but I think it's a lot easier from an individual standpoint to see what you're doing as an instructor making an impact on the diversity and inclusion of your classroom, equity might take years, might take policy changes, might all sorts of other things that take. Uh, and I, I, so that's the first thing I want to mention. The second thing that goes with it, I'm not an expert at this at all. So what I've done is I've reached out to some people, including my former TA, Merve Bastigan, who just got a tenure track position at Texas Tech. And she had done some searching through um, she had had a, had a job in the School of Public Health where she had to address diversity, equity, and inclusion in all the classes there. And she found websites, Cornell, Teachers College Columbia, Carnegie Mellon, University of Michigan were among the most prominent websites for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I went to those websites and I scanned through and I've picked some, what I consider to be the golden nuggets from each of those. And I put it into this talk. And, and Michigan, Cornell, Columbia, they all label it as diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I didn't feel like it was a problem to label it as diversity, equity, and inclusion if the entire University of Michigan is labeling it that way, and Cornell, and, and Carnegie Mellon, and Teachers College, and there are a couple others in here in this talk, including Indiana. Uh, but Indiana was in a sense of transition when I was exploring it, and it probably is still in a sense in somewhat of a transition. So all these precursors are to say, whatever I'm going through tonight, it, it can only touch a, a fragment of what's out there in terms of addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, and um, not all of it. And I and I, the latter half of this talk, I might skip. Um, not all of it will relate directly to, but I I have some examples from my individual classes with students in my classes. And back when Alicia was here the first time, there's some uh, pictures and images of the folks interacting and doing different activities to make things more. A collaborative, interactive, and engaging for them. Um, that doesn't mean that those are always addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
So act, active learning and universal design for learning is not the same as diversity equity addressing diversity equity inclusion, but there's a lot of overlap between all, all of this, especially from my standpoint of someone who's been trying to address multicultural needs and act be more engaging and active in one's environment than um, maybe others might have been. So uh, all these are precursors because I'll just, again, I, I, I don't want to, don't go talking to one of your professors and say, Dr. Bonk gave us this great, he's the expert at diversity and inclusion and all this. And they're just going to say, he doesn't know anything about diversity and inclusion. And so I just, I want to get that on the table. Don't, this, don't, re, don't rely on everything to, to, to certify you as a diversity and inclusion expert. I'm not one. I don't know many people who are. This is just a start. <laughs> so, have I put enough precursors on this talk? <laughs> enough qual? I'm a former accountant. Enough qualifiers? <laughs> okay, let me just say. And so, we'll go for about forty-five minutes, and then I'll field some questions. Then we'll take a long break, and Dr. Didi will come uh, and join us. So, um, uh, it's almost twenty to six uh, in here. Um, but again. Before I start, does anyone have any questions about what I've said or about other things in this class about uh, 622? Um, I said R511 before, this is 622. Apologies. Um, so anything, you're all working your projects, tasks three and four. I'm sorry to hit your brain so hard this week. Okay. Let me go to these slides. I think this is them. Okay, right. Again, when I had a chance to present to North Texas faculty, I think it went well because they wanted to hire me as their department chair. So I said, no. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a lot of fishing. Fishing meaning there's, they're trying, people are trying to address issues that are raised um, in, in all, all sorts of means. And, and so I think in part, I presented to North Texas, it was a checkbox that had to be completed so they can say they had a webinar on DIE and so forth. So um, again, yeah, I'll just stop there. Um, so let me hide my, I'm gonna hide you all so I don't see this floating video panel. So, you know, you can, you can listen, you can take notes on this talk, you can reflect on it and you might think about to what degree are each of the ideas presented here related to inclusion or a genuine sense of belongingness and value? To what degree are um, the ideas addressing sense of differences and perspective taking and, and um, thinking about the cultural, being more culturally aware and culturally intuitive of what's going on? And to what degree do some of the ideas address sense of fairness and opportunity and support or, or equity? Um, I, while I said it's harder to address equity, from my opinion, I think that the free books that I've created are, that is one aspect of how I've tried to address equity by making resources available for people to support them in their needs and so forth. Okay. So there's different guides that are out there that you can download. And if you download my slides, you can click on this article from the Chronicle of Higher Education, which describes, which gives advices on how to make your teaching, Christie's a teacher, and some of you all, others are teachers, how to make it more inclusive. And so and often, I should say often, like every three months, the Chronicle has this fantastic, the Chronicle of Higher Education, I'm saying, has fantastic guides on teaching and learning or on mentoring or on assessment. And this is one of them. Um, I would recommend you, you know, download and reflect on and take a look at. So if you go to my Dropbox and for this class and you go to the instructor slides, you, you can have all the links. They're all right here, right? And so, in fact, this in, in included, they have, they have links to other articles. So the Chronicle not only summarized real nicely what um, our effective strategies for addressing diversity, they and being become more inclusive, they have other articles that they wrote in the past that they link to as well. Um, three key principles of inclusive, inclusive teaching, how will you know if your efforts are working on other resources and so forth. When I was doing my digging last spring, uh, one chart that came to 
in my face immediately was this one by Hammond from 2017. It's an equity chart, a distinctions of equity chart to get people to think about social justice, multicultural ed, culturally responsive teaching, and so forth. And you see it's the categories there are divided up or the, the columns are divided up according to things you can do from a multicultural education standpoint and celebrating diversity and, uh, and inclusion and, and, and so forth to, to on the right-hand side, culturally responsive instruction or education, uh, and in the middle, social justice education. And they have some examples or some uh, areas that people tend to focus in on. So if you're having difficulty making distinctions on what aspects of equity we're discussing or talking about, this chart might be helpful for you, might be one that you look to and you might build upon or might um, might yourself uh, incorporate in your own teaching. Well, one of the universities that uh, I found some resources at was what we used to call Uncle Charlie's Summer Camp, UCSC. Um, Uncle Charlie's Summer Camp is on the West Coast out in Santa Cruz, California, where it's all a bunch of trees and and people live in the trees basically actually if you read the chronicle some people are because they can't find any housing there right now they're uh, overbooked <laughs> um, but ucsc uncle charlie's summer camp is a great place to visit and they've been thinking about udl not diversity and inclusion necessarily but udl and my friend susie my former student susie Granseth at university of houston also has published a book on universal design for learning and what goes into that, what, what we think about in terms of UDL. Now, UDL is not DIE, but there's overlap significant between these two terms. Um, UDL, in fact, we had three or four in-service workshops in the School of Education a few years ago when I was the chair of the committee for technology integration kinds of things. And so School of Ed has been very attuned to UDL, I think in providing some training for faculty, uh, including you know, multimedia education or dual coding of information, making uh, activities more engaging, uh, more participatory, more sustainable, uh, to promote student uh, active um, responsiveness and feeling like they're connecting to the content and so forth. So one place and one set of resources you can go to for UDL is Uncle University of California, Santa Cruz, and the link is in there. Another place was Cornell, and Cornell had some uh, excellent teaching and learning resources to foster a diversity in the classroom um, through reflection, through storytelling, through other kinds of active learning kinds of approaches. And the, the third place that I found a lot of resources was Carnegie Mellon. I don't think of always Carnegie Mellon as a place to get a computer science degree or engineering. I really didn't think about it as a place to focus on inclusive instruction, but that you know is is very important, of course. I also think about it as a place for AI and education, the geometry tutor and the algebra tutor that they created back when I was getting my doctoral degree. Um, Carnegie Mellon's been also a leader in open education and, and uh, alternative past education. So maybe it's not too surprising that they're um, providing some guidelines for inclusive education as well at Carnegie Mellon. Another place that I found resources with the University of Michigan, inclusive teaching and, re as I mentioned, inclusive teaching resources and strategies. And some of those are equity focused teaching and learning strategies. Some of those are um, uh, strategies for thinking about becoming more inclusive in one's instruction. I will say we've had a few IST students hired at the University of Michigan to work in that exact center. Uh, one of whom is a good friend who just retired from it. One of whom is a former student just got a job there. So Michigan tends to be one place, a landing spot. Christy knows Michigan's doing a lot of things there. A landing spot for uh, instructional designers, actually. They've got a, a lot of excellent things going on. Another place that I found excellent resources was the University of Colorado at, at Denver where I've been a couple of times, um, they, their resources were more focused on uh, inclusive teaching resources. And they provide, they have a report on them, but they also provide a self-guide tour to help equip you with uh, skills. So you can become um, an instructor, a trainer, or instructional designer who's more 
attuned to the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion needs. As I mentioned at the start, Columbia Teachers College or Teachers College at Columbia University has a center for teaching and learning where they have a whole suite of teaching and learning resources as well. Um, and they have different principles of um, to abide by in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the number one principle of support, a classroom that fosters belongingness is very important. Um, a, a principle number two, uh, setting explicit student expectations. Principle number three, uh, to look at um, and recognize diversity and acknowledge um, the barriers to um, inclusion and addressing diversity. Principle number four, designing all courses to be more accessible, whether it's accessible for special needs or accessible for people with a range of uh, educational backgrounds um, or expectations. And principle number five is to uh, reflect on one's beliefs about teaching online so as to maximize your commitment to becoming more of an inclusive instructor. They have many other principles if you go to that website. Then there's Indiana University, which I said was in a state of transition, but Indiana's always, always, since I've ever been here, always provided a lot of support, um, technology particular support um, for student learning and active learning. We have a project called Mosaic, which I'll, I'll actually be presenting Next next time, uh, the week after I come back, in two weeks, we have the Mosaic people coming in here talking about what's going on. Uh, another, in terms of addressing uh, inclusiveness and diversity, you might want to think about making your courses more hybrid, more flexible, more high flex. So as maybe to give students a choice of face-to-face -face or online. And you can get Brian Beatty's book on high flex learning. Brian is my former student. He's at San Francisco State University and has made a name for himself with the high flex model, which was widely embraced during the pandemic, during COVID times, and widely hated during COVID times because it's a lot of work. I utilized it two years ago for two classes and let students do online or face-to-face -face each week. They could decide what they wanted to do. And by the end of the course, nobody was coming face-to-face. -face. Everyone was online pretty much. It's hard to do both. It's not as hard to blend where you know the students are gonna be remote and face-to-face, -face, but when they have a choice, you have to really double prepare things um, for them. So now I get into some ways you can begin to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. I have 20 ways. Um, and so uh, one thing that was talked about at Carnegie Mellon website when I went through and mined it a little bit, they, one. One thing they mentioned was being explicit about your expectations in the course. Uh, like I've done in here, posting sample tasks, which I hadn't done the year before last year because I hadn't taught the course before. I had no examples. Somebody asked about an example and I found some, I put them up. I think I put some of the rubrics up for this class. They're only, it's only a second time. I imagine the rubrics will change slightly this time, but they'll, I'll probably pretty much utilize them. Uh, so again, putting putting those up so that students' tension goes down a little bit, right? And you can see whether or not you um, have the, the same expectations as the instructor does or as your peers do. A uh, second thing that Carnegie Mellon mentions is something I do in all my classes, allowing choice in papers and projects, letting them decide on uh, how to turn them in, what format they're going to be, maybe even the media type, the delivery format. Uh, length can be a can be a problem, but I often uh, allow students some say in the, the actual length of the products that are produced. Um, so topical choice in particular, uh, activity choices in particular, group collaboration choice. Choice can be in terms of who you work with, how you work on, what you turn in. Mm, uh, how it builds, maybe. You can start a uh, task two, could build a task three, could build a task four. There's all sorts of choice in, in, in a course. You, instead of having one-off activities, have it be um, not iterative, but have them build on one another so, so as to show growth. A third thing that Carnegie Mellon mentioned at their website, it, uh, well, yeah, is to allow choice in the format of the task. That's what I was getting at in the site. So I was jumping ahead. So allow students to decide, do I want to do a, a paper or do I want to do a podcast show? Do I want to do a video presentation? Do I want to do 
um, a news hour or, or a um, maybe a, a, some kind of debate or something else. So allow them that option. And so um, I have my own podcast show as showing up here and you can listen to any week. The first, we had 166 episodes so far. And last Saturday was the first time we forgot to hit the record button. <laughs> we had a, a session on AI <laughs> with two pretty well-known people. <laughs> and our lead host who handles the Zoom every week was in China. And we, we've done it before. We've handled it, but we just forgot. We got talking and we just we was having a great conversation <laughs> until we got to the end. <laughs> okay. So Carnegie Mellon also talks about you know, how much the, you know, opportunities, how many opportunities you give students to perform, what kind of opportunities you give students to perform. Uh, how do you make it more low stakes? Well, one thing way to make it more low stakes is to allow grace periods for the activity and give students a couple of days. Last year, I was giving five days or a week, ah, 10 days. This, <laughs> this semester, I decided two days is pretty good. That's enough. I'm just, I change it every time. Um, you know, I allow resubmissions. When I don't like something, I give it back to the students. Say, hey, you can make it better. And they make it, you know, so I won't even grade it. If I don't think it's coming close to what was expected, I'll just send it back. And if they, someone scores significantly low, I'll say you can redo it, you know, for a couple of bonus, whatever it is. Um, so flexible deadlines, allow retaking of quizzes, allow opt out, uh, some allowed people to throw away the time. Top, um, the lowest quiz or the lowest two quizzes, some ways to take the stress off people so they can really focus on performing and so forth. Um, and then polling students, what do they want? What do they need? One thing that I could do a better job of is getting students sense of what they would like to do. What's, what technologies they'd like to use to perform? What are their expectations coming in? Now I will ask students their expectations in many of my classes, but I, I, I at the beginning of the semester, but I don't necessarily ask it every week. And I think that's a really, number five is really important to kind of have antennas up on a weekly basis. Again, it's Carnegie Mellon's idea. Another Carnegie Mellon idea is to provide uh, multiple examples um, so that you can connect to people who might be coming from another culture or continent or region of the world, or be part of a different age group, which was brought up without all this fancy technologies that we have today, or uh, different social economic backgrounds and different um, accessibility issues in terms of the technology. Now, I had an accessibility here in my own house for when I smith switched to this high-speed internet, what was in high speed, <laughs> it was really bad. And um, I finally called and the guy comes over, he goes, well, you got a bad whatever um, uh, system, you know, the, the like the modem in the old, I don't know what they call the box. It had to be replaced. It was going. And all of a sudden I got a new one. And so it's like, oh, wow. Ooh. Three seconds to upload a 160 meg document. Oh, that's pretty good. So um, sometimes I talk to students about how they can um, get better access, such as using the local library or local bookstores uh, or Barnes and Noble and so forth. Um, finding finding ways to help them out in some ways. Some schools have laptop um, uh, loaner programs and other kinds of things. Uh, polling students for full participation, having everyone involved. I, in, in my face-to-face -face classes, everyone gets a sticky note. And Alicia might recognize some people in this picture. She might be in the picture somewhere here, maybe, maybe not. Um, but, you know, giving everyone some, some, some opportunities to voice their opinions or their ideas, um, to have them in brainstormed and jamba uh, in in uh, Jamboard or in uh, Flipgrid or in Pat Padlet or have sticky notes on the wall. I used to use green, yellow, and red, pink sticky notes. Green is mean is a go. We can use that idea. Yellow is maybe a cautionary, and red is no. I can't use it. And we put them on the wall. And we breed each other's ideas and so forth. Or even handing out a deck of cards and doing activities from based on the cards that people got or based on random number generators. There's a website called random.org where you can randomize who's going to present and in what order. And so it's not you picking on a group to go first, second, or third. Random.org picked it and so forth. So again, these are different ways to, to be more inclusive and, and uh, allow people to, um, 
to actually opt out. If they are in the random number generator picked first, you cannot allow them to go second if, if they have to, if they want to. And then I hold multicultural events in my class. Uh, food in particular is a winner, uh, as you can see on the right there. And I think Alicia might know somebody again there in, in those pictures uh, from five, six years ago when she was here. Uh, but this is a very popular thing is to have people bring in foods from Turkey or from from Bangladesh or wherever people are coming from. Um, maybe they don't bring in food from the UK because it's not really that good, but it's gotten better. UK food is actually... It's, it's actually pretty excellent, depending on the city you're going to. If you're going to Leicester, the Indian food is really good. Uh, and maybe in London, the Italian is good. Anyhow, um, a whole, uh, one thing I do is to, to hold uh, the start and end of class sessions with brainstorm lists to get the student's voice down and take a picture of it and post it and so forth. So I often will come in for a face-to-face -face class and give everyone a marker and send them to a marker board. And just I just you know, facilitate the interactions around the marker board and give them ideas um, and structures and templates. So as they can have some early voice to, to, to start, hit the ground running, not with a lecture for me, but having them fill up the whole, all the walls. We have, we have wraparound rooms with everything and then, you know, end the class the same way or do some rankings, priority rankings and so kind of thing. And then recognize the accomplishments of your students, recognize what they've contributed and done with the, within the course and so forth. There's a, that's a School of Ed lobby if you haven't been to the School of Ed in Bloomington, I know most of you have. Um, create a sense of belongingness of your students. And so, you know, have, you know, utilize the breakout rooms is a way to get students to know one another. Have some pairs and group-based act, group activities where mutual knowledge is um, shared or have some icebreakers or some introductory activities or some games and fun and so forth so as uh, students don't necessarily want to leave the class. And then the right-hand side is the outdoor classroom at IU Bloomington that no one ever uses. I, I only use it once in a while, a great while, um, but that's a space that can mix things up and you know create some, some opportunities to interact in different kinds of ways. Um, embed um, culturally diverse examples within your content, content and then to foster you know, diverse activities within and that's Carnegie Mellon, and that's um, University of uh, California Santa uh, Cruz, both at both websites. So opportunities could include doing a um, even a think pair share activity, but uh, a structured controversy where a couple of students have one side of the point of view, other students have different side point of view. They debate the two sides, two different sides, and then maybe switch roles and then debate again, and then maybe come to compromise. So some kinds of activities, whether it's panels or debates or structured controversy, or even just simple think, pair, share, uh, ways in which you're sharing perspectives and ideas with one another and interacting about them. Um, I cover a lot of these ideas in R546, which I haven't taught in about th three years, two, at least two. I uh, hope to do it in a year or two, we'll see. Um, having students share their the things that are unclear. What are the, what are the um, the muddiest what we call muddiest points or you know the the I, items that didn't stick real well that they want to come back to that they want re-explained or clarified so often you know I will have students send me an email everyone sends an email at the end of class to me with a little reflection on how things went and what was unclear what was clear what was valuable what was less valuable or have people fill in a, a little sticky note and just put it on the door as they leave. What was the something that didn't strike you know real well with them and, and didn't, hit, didn't hit home and how could I do better and so forth. So, so getting students perspectives and opinions and just letting students pose questions um, instead of always the instructor posing questions, having them come to the class with questions or blog posts and reflective logs or diaries on the readings and on the class. And maybe create, you know, a a notes, cliff notes on the readings with the students and have them create a wiki of all the, the things that they've learned and a little wiki, you know, um, manual for the class on the, every week's readings, for instance, or maybe coming to the class with their blog posts printed out and having them posted on the walls and discussing them in, in a face to face class and circling the key concepts or maybe having students do a KWL. What did you know? about this topic already? What do you still want to know because you didn't learn it well enough? And how will you learn it? And now you're getting at students um, and what their needs are, what, what they would like 
to have you do in the future to help address their needs better, I guess. And so I often will do, th th this is in a face-to-face -face class here. This is in an online class where, you know, what, what do you still want to know? What, what, what's out there, you know? Um, what, what's, what's still conf uh, confusing to you? Um, and that let students ask each other the questions that they brought in. Um, maybe do some reciprocal questioning among one another. Maybe you have some, you know, students, you maybe give them one, two, three, four, and have the ones bring in kind of summative kinds of questions and, you know, have the twos bring in different, you know, um, controversial kinds of questions maybe, or the spur discussion debate. Um, so you maybe ask for different kinds of questions or have everyone bring a question, maybe collect them and then hand them out to different teams and have them discuss and debate ideas within their, those teams. Uh, maybe have card sharing or trade card trade sharing shows, or maybe have fishbowl activities where students are on the inside are able to talk are, are able to talk and students who are sitting behind them cannot and then they switch roles and those on the outside move to the inside and can talk. You know, all sorts of ways to get people to interact, have some social icebreakers throughout the semester. University of Michigan says just use icebreakers. These can be activities or questions that are per directly pertinent to the course, uh, learning goals, but give students opportunities to share their individual experiences. So, you know, whether the you know, the ice breaking activity is an introductory type of activity where you, you're having everybody share one aspect about themselves, their, their hobbies, their interests, their favorite pastimes, their favorite cities, whatever it happens to be. And so you, um, you, can, you can do that within a class. And we just had Millie show up from China, my former visiting scholar. Hi, Millie. It's good to have you here from China. Never know who's coming in. Um, emphasize the big picture. Many instructional strategies that you might have heard about in the past, whether we're talking reciprocal teaching where the teacher or the student becomes the teacher temporarily to teach a reading lesson, or we're talking about, um, I don't know, jigsaw method where the you divide tasks up you know, amongst the students or the structured controversy task or debate, whatever it is, those things do not work so well when the vision, the purpose, the relevance isn't explained. If there isn't a, a front loading of the, of the mission or the per intent or the purpose, once you lay out the purpose, you can get buy-in from the students a lot better. And, and so that's a critical, and again, Carnegie Mellon, to emphasize the big picture, emphasize the relevance, the value, the value to them, make it meaningful, make it authentic, make it relevant to your learners. Why is this, this esoteric topic even discussed in this class? Well, they might, there might be a purpose behind it because the jobs are going to be addressing it in the near future, potentially. And then make course contents accessible and open. So some talk about uh, utilizing tools that you know, have text to speech. Some people can then listen to it instead of just um, reading it. If they might be visually impaired in particular, have things available that are video based as well as text based. You know, auto audio books as well as textbooks, films and PDF documents and so forth, or chat PDF instead of chat GPT and have chat PDF summarize the article for you. Um, utilize both async and synchronous options. My research, and I've been researching synchronous for two and a half decades at least, been in, in, um, researching async for three decades or more. Asynchronous people go into more depth. There's more um, substance to what they're saying. Synchronous tends to be more lively, more sh shorter, more short, but much more, you know, spontaneous, instant messaging, you know, you know, live chats. Um, and so you get more immediate feedback. They're both valuable. They're both valuable. But I find that having an asynchronous event before the synchronous is probably more valuable. To have students debate an article from someone for a, a week or so that they've read or you assigned and then bring the real person in or have, watch, have them watch a video on that person and they'll find out that person is different from their article. That one article doesn't represent a scholar. That their research might have moved on. They might have you know, change the research. And so you can't overgeneralize from one reading, one research article or two research articles and so forth. And then invite 
the sharing of the resources. Columbia Teachers College at their website talked about the sharingness. And I totally agree with that. A global call for sharing because in the past, we didn't share much of what went on in the classroom settings. The, these are little boxes that teachers taught in and nothing happened outside of it. So I try to get people to share their you know, discoveries, their idea generations, um, and, and whether we're creating an ebook for the class or a podcast show or, or whatever. So I've talked about this last week, the different roles of the instructor, the different instructional principles. I had this up there last week as well. And because that's those are kind of alive and well within the you know, Carnegie Mellon website and the other websites and so forth. This semester, I'm going to, a couple of times, I'm going to cut back to my, uh, my free book, the Tech Variety book, which stands for 10 Motivational Principles. And I'm going to give a few examples tonight. We have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes left. We got a lot of time. So um, this Adding Tech Variety book is available in Chinese and in English to download. It came out in 2014. As I mentioned, maybe in here before, it's been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. And the counter broke seven years ago. So I actually don't know how many times. There's a new version of this book that came out a year ago. In the book, we have 10 activities for autonomy, 10 activities for interactivity, 10 activities for tone and climate, each one of those motivational principles. And here's the new book that Elaine Ko from New Zealand and I wrote um, back that the first one, and she helped me with the second one. She, I took the lead in the first one. She took the lead in the second one. Um, <clears throat> she lives in Hamilton, where she was at the University of Waikato. Now she's at Massey University. Uh, working in Auckland, commuting from Hamilton, I think. There's also a free class with the book, um, the second book called Motivating and Supporting Learners Online. And the second book is available through the Commonwealth of Learning in the um, in Canada, um, in Vancouver. So we have 100 activities, and these 100 activities are highlighted within the course that you can take, or any of your students, any of your colleagues, any of the any of your colleagues at your institution, your organization, your school, your university, it's all free. Both books are free. The course is free. Um, so this is one way in which I think I've helped address equity, but you know, there's other things we all can do. So we want to foster interactivity engagement. We want to foster autonomy. We want to foster curiosity. And these are all embedded in those activities and so forth. And there's step by step. And then there are variations within the book. And then they all, all are rated from the degree of time, risk, and cost. So your colleagues might want low risk, low time, low cost activities. And that, you know, that's totally fine. That's where most people start. If you get the book and you download the whole thing, the last chapter or second last chapter is how to help resistant instructors get supported to do these kinds of things. So... Um, that's critically important and, and has come up in my talk Saturday night to China. That was someone had this, someone had the tech variety book, had that green book and says, well, you know, and someone else came up after and, you know, they talked about how to use the book and they wanted to know how to address instructors. Well, it's right there in the book at the end of the book, how they can help create system systemic change with their, their institution. So some examples, warm up questions. Um, actually, you can type in the, the chat window, you know, how do you, how are you feeling today? Are, you're feeling great, like Superwoman? Or B, I'm feeling really good, thank you. C, I'm a little tired, but fine. D, not sure, but I'm glad to be here. E, not fully here, not fully there. I'm kind of sorted out, trying to sort out. Well, that's maybe me this <laughs> whole so, past week, getting five talks ready for Cairo. Um, plus one for Tokyo, one for China, one for Malaysia, one for Boise State. So nine talks, plus this one, 10 in the last one. Are you feeling overwhelmed or put F and other? I'm just curious what people put. So the first one, tone and climate, you know, just putting your information in Padlet and sharing with one another, your hobbies, your interests, your passions. Have a little warm up activities in the jam board to share with one another and find out, get mutual knowledge, get inner subjectivity with one another, find out something that's unique about each other 
And so you can utilize that when you do end up doing group work together or chat with one another, email one another, you start to know each other a little bit better. So you can take a risk in, 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 in contacting someone within the class or having video-based discussions with Flip, what was called Flipgrid, have threaded video discussions reflecting on maybe the first week's readings or your introductions and so forth. Um, and or as my friend here, Nellie Chabot, who's a CNN hero, um, she's she's repurposing computers for kids in Nigeria and other parts of Africa and, and getting them access to open educational resources so they can get certificates and degrees and take courses and so forth. So one way we can address diversity and inclusion is to tap into the open education world like she's doing there and foster curiosity of students, showing them something unique that's available only in an online format and getting them excited, getting them to, in, into an adventure, if you will. Or our guest from week two in here, Dr. Paul Kim, or week three in here, Dr. Paul Kim, who showed us the Smile Project. Well, he had several interviews that he sent to all of us, and one of them was about his career, his life. And so these kind of career-based interviews you could share with your students. If you're studying biologists or chemists, find some interesting, fascinating people and share their career-based interviews with them and get them curious about them. Uh, for, you want to build variety in your classes so it's not to be bored. One way to build variety is instead of asking traditional kinds of questions of your students, instead of asking how to you know, how can we increase creativity in schools? You can ask the reverse question and throw everyone by surprise. And say, oh, how can we increase costs of health care? Oh, how can, we how can we study worse? <laughs> for, for, uh, how can this class be worse? You know, instead of asking, how can it be better? So getting people in a different mindset and breaking them out of the standard ruts that we're all in. And then giving people choice among the resources that are available to them so that they can... Um, utilize different um, courses or um, uh, videos that might be of interest to them and only of the, to them. These are refugees in this picture here uh, were um, moving moved to Germany from Syria and from other parts of the world. And in Germany, they have Kiran University, which has resources for refugees to to access and use during the first year that they're there because during the first year you're in Germany, you can't take traditional university courses as what I've been told. And so they found a way for them to, to get educated um, in the meantime. And on my podcast show, we're gonna have a, a organization that's providing exactly these kinds of services um, so that, um, and they've won an award, a, what's called a WISE Award. And it's got a long name that I'll never be able to pronounce but uh, they'll be on in November, so about six weeks from now. So my podcast show has you know, been uh, on for three and a half years, and until this last Saturday, has always worked. <laughs> we finally made a snafu this week, but okay, that happens. Uh, but we're available on webcasts and podcasts and several kinds of streaming services so that you can subscribe on Apple iTunes and so forth and reflect. And I go jogging. I re-listen to the, these things or go walking on, 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 on the trails and so forth. And so have students subscribe to podcast shows. Have, you know, have people, you know, your students in your classes, um, you know, utilize these free and open online webcasts, podcasts, and, and audiobooks and other kinds of things. And there are many uses for these uh, uh, online podcasts and webcast shows that you can you can um, embed within your courses. You know, you can have debates based on the different perspectives, have people find videos that relate to different points of view and then debate them and bring them to class and have them support the, their side of the debate or their side of, um, uh, of their point of, of interest. Anyhow, even if it's not a debate, you can have them utilize these to help create a framework or a model a draft, a draft an educational model based on the five or 10 webcasts that they've listened to or watched um, during the semester. Have them maybe replay different episodes, you know, portions of each episode, or contact the authors in them or the people that are highlighted in them. There, there are all sorts of things that you could do besides just doing reflection kinds of paper. And, and the relevance and meaningfulness, MIT, 
has you know created open courseware and made all their courses free to the world, as you know. And and I couldn't get into MIT when I was younger. I, I'll be kind of surprised if you any of you were. Well, hopefully you were trying, right? But not, it's not easy to get into MIT. But today you can take any course from MIT for free. There's no instructor behind it, but it's called MIT Open Courseware. And the guy on the right was someone who took advantage of this. He was in Uganda. And like millions of others during COVID, he turned to the YouTube to pass his time. And, he, you know, uh, when he wasn't an influencer or watching music videos, he became a lifelong learner. He was using MIT Open Courseware and charting his progress in different things, or going to Coursera, or going to Duolingo, or going to some other website. So I've been studying Duolingo learning. I've been studying MOOC-based learning. I've been studying um, ChatGPT YouTubers and all sorts of... I've been looking at Open Courseware from MIT for a long time. Um, I've been studying open access to contents from Merlot, M-E-R-L-O-T dot org since 1997. For 25 years, I've been studying this. This is a case example. So you can do activities with real world cases in your classes. MIT provides a new case at least once a month, but often multiple kinds of cases. And they're, they're free and open and that, open to use. And what I've done with videos once and as you know, I guess I've provided them for you, is once I teach a class, I create a playlist of all the guests that I've had. So they're not just one-off guests. They, we can cycle back through and listen again and have people do other papers from it and other act, kinds of activities, make it more relevant to the students. Like last year's guests are available for you. And next year's guests are going to be available for, you know, this year's for next year and so forth. And so last semester, I taught dissertation proposal writing. Actually, last year at this time and last spring, both. I taught it all year last year. Well, I had great guests. I had great guests like Florence Martin talk about doing systematic reviews of the research. Well, it was wonderful. I can reuse it, put it in a playlist, right? Um, and, and other topics, how to defend your dissertation, how to put your literature review together and writing tips and so forth. You could all maybe benefit from that set of resources that are made available. So when I bring in Vanessa Denon, who's a former student of mine, a close colleague, or I bring in Richard Mayer, the most famous educational psychologist in the world, whose first job was at IU for a year in psych, um, and who was the best guy, one of the best guests I've had. Yeah, so I can re reuse them, reuse them. See, my friend Tiagi is 190 years old, but he came back into my class a couple, he lives three miles from my house down the street. He used to be an ISD faculty member Back in the day, he was a magician in India. He was a he was doing all sorts of crazy stuff till someone found him and brought him to Indiana. <laughs> it's a true story, actually. And he's become one of the most famous creativity experts in the world, online facilitation and other kinds of things. So record you know, these people and bring them into your classes. You know, Shamim is another former student of mine who's in a bank um, in Malaysia. And um, she was a guest in this class and has been twice about um, uh, female entrepreneurship and diversity, equity, and inclusion last year, a year ago, um, about almost exactly. John Gray's my, on the left, my first doc student at Indiana, talked about change management. I brought him twice. I brought him last semester and last spring, and I brought him a year and a half ago into my class. So how can we reuse these videos? Well, interviewing, have students interview these people a year later or two years later and find out what changed how their lives have changed, what's new in their lives. Um, have them, you know, write trend papers based on what the, the, the interviews are all about, what they've said, or have them tag the episodes for and categorize them or rank them or rate them somehow, or utilize them in discussions and debates and so forth. Um, one tool my students used for debates with students at Wayne State my former student, Maina Jewett, went to Wayne State. In the first semester she was there, or second semester, we had her students debate Indiana students using Nuclino. We used a book um, that we use in 511 um, by Ali Karchelman, which was all set up to be debatable. They had point, counterpoint, different people taking points of view. So they had to assume the roles of different chapter authors. It was kind of cool. It's, kind of, it's not flawless. Nuclino's I had a free version. It's like a wiki. If you accidentally delete it, you can't get it back. So that while it's free, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect here. 
Uh, number 10, did I skip all the way from seven to 10? Yeah, I guess I went off from seven to 10. Number 10, using Canva. I'm right now using Canva. I'm developing a calendar for next year on, with my quotes on leadership, learning, and life. Um, but students in this class and other classes use Canva to build timelines, to build uh, overviews, mind maps, and other kinds of things, brochures, infographics, and flyers. So one thing about diversity, equity, inclusion is giving people some, some opportunities to, to build, to, to create, to generate something that they're proud of, that they're interested in, that they want to share with one another. Um, and so I think one of the students in this class has developed, has worked on task six before doing task three and four because he's so interested in doing so. Um, have, you know, have students build something like using press books. So in my podcast show, we had students who escaped Afghanistan at the last minute before the Taliban took over and the last one of the last flights out and they went to Bangladesh, the Asian University for Women, and they were on my show and they talked about they're writing a book in press books called Sp Strong Schools, How to Build Stronger Schools. So this is a project. This is this is empowering. This is this is project and problem-based learning both. And, and getting people to to write about something of dear interest to all of them, right? And do some social justice, you know? My my uh, title for that show is Bands Don't Work in an Open World Afghan Women Find Educational Opportunities in Bangladesh. It's a great episode if you want to listen to that one. The link is there. So that's the tech variety model um, from tone and climate to encouragement. I, again, I didn't go through all of them. I'm going to come back to it. I'll go through tech variety again later in the semester. I'll go through my R2D2 model, re read, reflect, display, and do as well. Um, hopefully you've got a couple of ideas from this. If you, yes, definitely got some ideas, put an A in the drop box in the chat window, put a B if you got several things, um, put a B or a C. If you didn't get anything, put a D, E, or an F. <laughs> And we'll move on. The other model I mentioned was my R2D2 model, read, reflect, display, and do. I'm looking at the time work. Okay. Yeah, we're okay. So um, this model is based on kind of Kolb's model of, of, of learning styles, but it's really not a learning style model. If you look carefully, this is a problem solving wheel. You see, psychologists like Christy and I, we don't believe in learning styles because learning styles don't hold water. They're like Myers Briggs inventory. You know, they intuitively make a lot of sense. <laughs> I'm a shy person, you know, I'm an extrovert, whatever. But, you know, from a, from a practical standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. But from a psychological standpoint, the factors in here, the, the criteria don't hold a lot of water for test, retest, reliability um, and validity. But anyways, this is getting people to read and then reflect and display their learning, then do something. You can go in the opposite way. You can do something and then reflect on it. But this is one way we, you know, we thought about. So, anyways, I've got just a couple of so the auditory learners, verbal learners, spoken words, and so forth. You know, listening to podcast shows and reflecting on them, right? Um, you know, listening to a, a technical report, have it speech to text or text to speech tools and so forth. So, listen to a, if you want to hear about educational technologists who are pretty well known, go to Mark Nichols' podcast show. He's Interviewed a bunch of people. I was interviewed a few months ago on it myself. It's got dozens and dozens of people around the world who are in educational technology. Fascinating website. Um, so you can get your students kind of mentored, apprenticed within that. As I said, going to you know text to audio kinds of tools are becoming increasingly popular, like Speechify. But there are probably many others that are free and so forth. I don't know if Speechify. Anyone using Speechify? It's got a free version and a paid version, right? or a premium version, I think. And then observational learners, watching, reflecting, observing, engaging, like in, you know, watching and reflecting in a debate, in a role play activity and assigning people different roles in that debate, whether they're coming in with a role of a pessimist or optimist or questioner or peacemaker or artist or judge or slacker or slough, those roles empower people. Those roles get people to, to feel like they're part of something, you know, and then you know, put up different kinds of visual data. Some syllabi today are all infographics. 
some course activities are all based on infographics te technology today. And, and students tend to like these formats for their learning kinds of things. And then you, as visual learners there, and then utilizing short video clip it, clips, such as from the BBC or from CNN or some other you know, TED Talks or TED Ed Talks and showing a short snippet of it to anchor the discussion, to anchor their learning in that short snippet of, you know, changing jobless rates or economics, you know, housing prices or whatever it is, if you're teaching economics or if you're teaching sociology or if you're teaching uh, some other course in business or in education and so forth. And then having people, you know, reflect on the, on the jam board, you know, do a PMI plus minus an interesting and, and displaying, you know, their learning on that. Uh, and then hands-on learning, you know, creating something and putting those things on display that you've created, the videos that you've created um, or the makerspace activities that you created, like my uh, student Tina did there. Um, and one student I had a year ago or two, year and a half ago, two, two years ago, Linda Smith, she spent 400 hours, no, I can't be, 300 hours in, in the semester building a set of videos explaining my Tech Variety book. And she broke her wrist in the middle of doing that. I don't know how she was able to finish, but that's a huge project. But she wanted to do it. Just get, empowering people, just getting them empowered to do something, right? And so um, you have to think about when you teach, how are you going to get students to, to critically reflect on the content? How are you going to motivate them? How are you going to get them, you know, to create something new, to push beyond the content that's there, to generate, to feel empowered, to feel pride in what they have produced? And then what kinds of collaborations are going to take place within the class? You know, because I, I really think we have to do all that. We have to have collaboration, motivation, critical and creative thinking. And if you agree, my R546 course is a place for you. We want to motivate give them goals, give them visions, give them support, give them mentoring, um, and, and get them um, rewards for their successes on their performances. We want to get them, you know, create creatively thinking and, and, and idea generating and innovating and, and sharing those innovations, in fact. So, you know, get them into the jam board to share their ideas and discuss them, but also put them on, you know, write them down and save that so they can come back to it and replay it and reuse it. We want them to get uh, empowered to ask questions. So I have these ask me anything sessions where they can, whatever things they want to ask about, they can. And, you know, have have questions for the guests. Whenever we'll guests like Chris, Dr. Didi in here, we can have questions in the jam board for Dr. Didi. I've written eight questions for him that I've got listed right here. And I sent it to him already. So, you know, he knows what I'm going to ask him, but he doesn't know what you're all going to ask him. So, uh, and critical thinking, you know, reciprocal teaching, students becoming the teachers, what are the pros, what are the cons, what are the interesting things about it to get, you know, critical reflection on that activity, you know, um, put, put those pros and cons up there, put those uh, pluses and minuses and interesting things up there and so forth. Do a Venn diagram and so forth. And then collaboration in the breakout rooms and other kinds of places, in the jam boards and other kinds of places, in the mind maps. So I think I'm going to end there because it is the end, isn't it? So um, I do have a couple of free books listed in those slides at the end. Um, and I think I'll stop. That's a lot further than I thought I would be uh, at 6.30. But we're going to do three things. One, we can do an ask me anything, just have you go ahead and ask me any question. Two, we can have um, one of you try and you know talk about how you're using diversity, equity, and inclusion in your kinds of setting. And three, we can do a little breakout groups and just chat about what I just discussed. So we can do an ask me anything. We could you we could do um, a breakout session. We could do, uh, we could leave <laughs> for a while and take a break. Um, what would you like? I see that we got the chat window here. I'll take the participants out. Any comments or questions? Everyone's shy here tonight.
was what I was saying accurate at all? I mean, do you catch any problems? And <laughs> I try to put enough qualifiers there in the front that, you know, again, others, instructors, both here or wherever you're located, they'll have other ideas. There's, you know, of course. Christy, you're unmuted. Yeah, I did unmute. Um, I can really relate to um, your qualifiers in your intro because that was exactly what I was thinking on my way in driving, thinking about um, what exactly would we be talking about in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for me, first and foremost is the student in terms of, you know, kind of UDL, but also just addressing the way that they want to learn. Um, you mentioned in my uh, response on the discussion board that I've had a lot of engaging activities and that's so accurate. But then again, what should we expect if someone is teaching best practices yet to embrace those best practices? And so, um, you know, I think of when I apply it to my own students, um, I try to see my classroom through their eyes and I try to think of all the different ways that they may want to learn. And for some of them, like in discussion posts, I give them the op opportunity to write, speak, or show. So they can create a video. They can do some sort of writing because that's a safe type of way to do it. Or they can, you know, share a picture or something like that and talk about it. So I think the flexibility for students really is a way to embrace that inclusivity. Um, I love all the classes I've taken IST. I am struggling hard with intermediate stats right now because it's not the same kind of format. Um, and I've been so blessed with those engaging activities. So to not have that cognitive flexibility, I can feel exactly what you're talking about, so. Yes, <laughs> that's a good example with stat courses. That, yes. you know, it, and what's interesting is since the, I've been here, the stat professors have embedded technology and sometimes better than others. And when I first got here, there weren't at all. So it all depends maybe on the instructor. Um, I agree. You know that that you have. Um, anyone else want to comment or question anything? Ask me anything. You feel free. It doesn't have to be related to what I just presented on. So comments. Um, I, lis I listened to your podcast of, on the four day school week with the mineral wells superintendent that caught my eye because mineral wells is just down the road from me. Oh, really? Um, yeah. It's been a real big hot topic. Um, you in the, podcast they talked about it works for their community it had to be embraced by the community to make it work but a lot of that goes into equity and inclusiveness because they had a student on there and a teacher on there they had to consider teachers and or really students who didn't have a safe place to go that school is their safe place uh, it was really interesting to hear a teacher and a superintendent's perspective um, as well as the the student they had. I think the student that you had on was more so she was going to thrive anywhere she was just yeah, because yeah. she's the go-getter. Right. Um, it would have been interesting to hear from a, a more middle-of-the-road high school student and kind of their opinion um, and maybe a parent perspective because I do Mineral Wells as a small town it is very culturally, they like to have their family time and things like that. So it was a very interesting conversation to listen to. Um, in my school district, it's a bigger school district in the suburbs. And so there's just not going to be the support for a four day work week um, like it is in a smaller Texas town. And you, you're seeing a lot more of that in West Texas and East Texas and those really small rural districts. So it was really interesting to listen to and get their perspective on. Yeah, what well, we've done a show where we've had four students or three students. That that's a show where we should have had, you know, uh, more more students. We could have kept her, but have others from other perspectives, you know, and, and have multiple teachers too, you know. Yes. 
And it, it was interesting because she was saying how a lot of students, they, or maybe it's the superintendent too, that the students have to work to help support. And so by that, they're learning really important life skills. They're learning how to balance everything and they're getting some informal learning and things like that of how to troubleshoot and how to balance everything um, as well as getting some work experience that is necessary for their family. Yep, there were good points made. Well, like you say, it was an interesting show, but it could have been better. I, I totally agree with you on that. That was one show. Well, it's not my highest. This is being recorded here, but it's not my, my highest rank. It was good. It was good. But we had a larger audience. It does help diversify it. Go back to diversity. Buying mm -hmm. things. So thanks for watching the show or listening to the show. I'm assuming you watched it or you did you listen to it? I watched it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah you did. Okay. Anyone I tried else? to do. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I've tried to do the podcast, um, but I think a lot of them, there are some visuals. And so I, I like watching them mm. on the YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Alicia, what do you think? Uh, yeah, um, I feel quite interested and curious about, uh, actually, I think this is very, very, um, it's amazing to motivate students uh, with various ways. But then I have a question about teacher training because actually you gave teachers higher requirement because you know the teacher should be know everything. <laughs> I think that teacher should have higher wide knowledge and they should know how to meet students various. Uh, uh, I mean, um, they should know how to make uh, students need analysis. So what? this uh, student may be like active way, interactive way, and the other student may like a remote way. So how can teacher, the first technology, right? <laughs> and second, uh, the teacher should know a lot of knowledge about how can we motivate our students. So um, this is my curiosity. How can you give teachers training to meet these requirements. I know this book is very popular and very uh, uh, like uh, hot topics, right? So uh, do you think so, about this aspect? Yeah, sure. You know, I think about what, should everybody take a course in scaffolded instruction? You know, should everybody take a course in question asking? You know, when I was a grad student, there was a guy named Stanley Pogro at Arizona, University of Arizona or Arizona State. He built the HOTS program. HOTS as opposed to LOTS. HOTS stands for higher order thinking skills and LOTS stands for lower order thinking skills. So he built the HOTS program and he used technology to uh, early days of, of personal computers. And teachers rotated as a facilitator in computer labs with the kids. And the teachers were not allowed to give answers. They were not allowed to tell an answer. They could only probe, they could only ask questions, they could only make statements. And it's very frustrating for the teachers to play a different role where they're not a, an answer giver, but they're more of a, you know, a question extender or, you know, a, a prompt prompt facilitator or frust they're frustrators. You know, they're frustrating the students because they're not getting the answers. But over the long haul, it had a huge impact on students' comprehension skills and test scores, problem solving, decision making. All those things, all what we talk about today, the digital learning skills of the 21st century, right? So a teacher should be trained in how to facilitate, how to moderate, how to question, how to rotate, how to um, feel comfortable walking away from a student when they don't have the answer, when you haven't given them everything and being able to, when they're still in a state of somewhat dissonance, they still have some disequilibrium, as Piaget would say, some frustration even. And be able to, to 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 take and go to the next station without having totally satisfied that first person. That's hard emotionally for everyone, you know. But it has kind of the kind of residue from it, the kind of gains from it. Again, they don't necessarily leave leave them totally abandoned. They'll rotate back and so forth. So there's a whole curriculum around the HOTS program, but there's other programs like, like this. It's not the only one game in town. It's not the only one. It's one that was federally funded research monies and showed it had a huge payoff in the school systems where it was implemented. 
Uh, but there's there's other ways that we can, you know, create communities, for instance. Maybe the focus is on building community where students share their successes with one another and embed their their example answers in an online discussion forum or so there's something up in Toronto that was called the Knowledge Forum, where kids would write their papers with other kids, just opposing their paper against another paper and extending each other, use, using ideas of their peers, sharing ideas back and forth. So it's a knowledge building. Uh, that, was a, that was a way to enhance their, their test scores as well. It's a different approach. The first one's a question asking approach. Second one's a knowledge building approach, right? And, and another way is just do a, a problem-based learning approach, right? And so embedding a whole curriculum in problems that, an in inquiry that students, you know, have to resolve. I mean, there's different models of, of instruction that are effective. And this course, as well as many courses in IST, are about those models, the frameworks for effective instruction. You're asking the next question. Given we have these models of what is effective you know, frameworks, that what is what should we be doing for teachers, teacher training? Should we change teacher training based on a certain model? Well, I don't think one model will do anymore. And so the, the tech variety framework is eclectic. The R2D2 model is eclectic. It cuts across ideas and, and so forth. So um, we're, we're better off, I think, than where we were 40 years ago or 50 years ago in education, but we still haven't, we don't know everything yet. I'll field one or two more questions then we have to take a break. So everyone gets a break before Dr. Didi comes. So who'd like to ask a question before we all head off to a break? Claudio's looking around. So I assume you have a question, Claudio. Uh, Dr. Bon, I don't have a question, but it, this is, uh, I was taking so many notes because it's the first time that uh, in my, place work, I am working in the Global Inclusion Office. So this is my first year and we are restructuring the office from DEI to having a more inclusive uh, structure. So all of this that you were talking about, like uh, curriculum integration and um, and all of that, I was taking so many notes because we're doing a lot of needs assessment over here, working with the students, parents, teachers, and trying to going away from the definition of PEI and having a more inclusive structure. Um, because as you said, and we also believe that the equity is kind of difficult to, to meet and uh, it's not very easy sometimes. So I think that creating these scenarios where students can be or feel included. And uh, I think that it's more valuable for them and also for, for the teachers uh, and, and but I want, want one comment that, uh, that I have. Do you think that higher education or uh, is helping students to or teachers to create these inclusive scenarios by having training programs or it's just up to them or up to each program or each department? Hopefully it's not up to each program or each department. Hopefully we're built, we're doing both. You know, you know, hopefully departmental levels, they're making some decisions that are helpful and beneficial to those teachers. But at the same time, the school district, the state, the federal government, uh, nonprofits, in particular nonprofits, in particular agencies, in particular, you know, these, you know, in, in other countries, NGOs, are providing those, are, are testing different forms of support for um, for instructors, for instructional designers, mm -hmm. for parents, for everyone. I mean, uh, hopefully the, there's a, a wealth of models being uh, utilize that are ferreting out the principles that are found to be effective in them. So it's a both and. It should be definitely, you know, um, we shouldn't uh, ignore it and say someone else is doing it. We, everyone should be doing something that's their part of the piece or part of the puzzle. And, but yet there should be some umbrella to capture the ideas and activities th uh, and frameworks and principles that are that work, that are effective so that others can replicate and it can extend it. So we get, so Chris Didi, or Dr. Didi, his number one word is scalability. So if anyone asks him a question about scalability, he'll smile, I promise you. Um, so just say, I heard you like, you're interested in scalability. Um, so yeah, so de you know, definitely. And one of my questions, if no one asks, will be about scalability. So we'll we'll see where we go from there. Um, so, so yeah, it's a great question, but given the, Issues in society today, it has to be an all hands on deck kind of thing, you know, and some yeah. are small, small commitments, 
Some are larger commitments, but a commitment to some degree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Millie, you're coming from China. Does your microphone work? Hi, Millie. We'll see if she unmutes. Uh, <laughs> what do you think, Millie? Yeah, it's, a, 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 it's great. Uh, just learn from uh, all of you about the uh, uh, STA. Uh, actually, I uh, for myself, I'm confused. Especially for like uh, uh, the, in, in the past uh, in the past three years about that like like video learning. Uh, I think it is not it is not uh, so effective. Uh, and just now like like uh, as Alicia, uh, Alicia about uh, it it is so challenging for uh, especially for, for for me for us uh Chinese uh, uh Chinese teachers. Uh, in the past three years, uh, online uh, learning, uh, online teaching uh, is a, I don't think it, it is so good, but uh, little by little, uh, we have been uh, trying to improve our on online teaching uh, uh, skill. Uh, even uh, this semester, la last week, I also tried to uh, teach online, uh, but uh, it's, um, Maybe for 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 students, uh, I uh obviously, uh, I found my students uh engaged on online uh, better than than before, uh, but uh, but it is still special for the video. I I also try to give them some uh video, uh, for for them to uh, learn uh to learn by themselves, but I th I don't think it 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 is good for um maybe I. I mean the, the the video learning uh, just uh, if I uh, make uh, some video for for students to learn by themselves, especially uh, now. Uh, I also have some uh, international students uh, in my class. Uh, sometimes they, they they couldn't uh, come to a physical uh, classroom, uh, so I, I try to make uh, make video for for them. But but I I found uh, uh, the. The, the the ratio of them engage is not so so good. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah, yeah, I got you. What you're saying. So one thing you you can do, and I've written on this. I've written about video, incorporating video. I've, and you write to me, I'll send you the, my articles. I've written on and shared online video. I've got a portal of shared online video sites, about seventy of them. But this is where the role of the teacher becomes extremely important in scaffolding the learning and scaffolding the instruction and creating templates of questions or templates with activities or advice or even shortened versions of the same videos so that they can utilize in, um, them in a more effective manner. I've actually worked on a project with people in Singapore. Um, we, we published an article about the use of, of shared online video to flip the classroom. And it was published last year, and I could send you that as well. So you know, I've done a couple of projects. Some have been funded, some have been my own. But I, you know, I'm a true believer of embedding video because it's empowering, because you can come back to it and replay it. You can play it at different speeds. Um, so you know, there, it becomes an anchor for learning. It becomes conceptual anchor. It can be. It doesn't that? It won't automatically be. So the role of the instructor is particularly important when you use any kind of media. In, in your instruction. It doesn't have to be video, it could be audio, it could be animations, it could be simulations, it could be something else, it could be immersive worlds. So the, that that's why sometimes instructors shy away from multimedia because it does require more work, at least screening them. Yeah. I've, made, I've made a mistake sometimes and used the wrong video because the students suggested, I said, okay, two bonus points for group two. They say, well, I'll, I put the video up and it's got nothing to do with the class, you know? And so I didn't pre-screen it, you know? And so that's, so you've yeah. got to you've got to be committed. You can't just put a video in there and just to to to, to take up time. <laughs> you mm -hmm. got to thoughtfully integrate. All technologies have to be thoughtfully integrated, right? And um, mm -hmm. so again, go back to the book. It's got some activities in there for video, but look for low risk, low cost, low time. But also, you need some advice about scaffolding the instruction, about job aids, about templates. Whatever it is, you have to design things to make it more thoughtfully integrated. That's my best yeah. answer. Yep. So we're going to take a break now. We have 10 minutes before Dr. Didi comes eight minutes. So everyone, um, I'm going to stop the recording here in a second once I find where it is and say, um, 
Thanks for coming to week five, part one. Hopefully most people will come to week five, part two. And there is no class next week in a face-to-face -face manner. I'll be in Egypt somewhere in Cairo. Um, but two weeks from now, we'll have people from the Mosaic Project at IU, the Active Learning Project, come join us. And so um, Tracy Birdwell and her research team will share with us on that. Um, so I'm stopping now. Now.